Um, my name is Stephen Kearns. I'm the director of the Future Cities Lab uh, Global Program based here in, uh, in Singapore. I work with a colleague who's based in Zurich by the name of Sasha Mentz, um, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you uh, to this event. Uh, the title is Why a Smart City, in, in quotation marks, is more than 5G and AI, and it's uh, presented by Callum uh, Hanforth from UNDP. Uh, before I introduce him, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the format of these seminars. Um, we invite our speakers to speak for around 30, 35 minutes, um, and we invite you to take part in discussion um, after that. Um, the discussion will be based around your questions, so please type them into the chat um, uh, format, and then I'll invite you to, uh, to, to articulate those, those questions uh, live, and it allows you, in a way, a kind of voice, uh, voice in the program. So thanks again. Um, Callum Hanforth, for those of you who don't know him, uh, is advisor on smart cities, digitalization, and digital health at the UNDP Global Center for Technology, Innovation, and Sustainable Development. Um, maybe you don't know that, that this, this particular kind of institutional framework, it's very important and relevant to us. There are a number of such global centers uh, around the world, and we're very uh, pleased to have one of them here in Singapore. And uh, Callum is a, is a very energetic uh, figure in that, in that organization. And we're very pleased to have that link. Um, we're working on a, on a letter of intent whereby we uh, think about uh, projects that, that are mutually interesting to us. Uh, this might even be one of those, uh, one of those initial uh, events, Callum, that, we, that we, we promised we would do together. So I'm very pleased that you could join us. Callum has a background in epidemiology um, and development studies and politics. Um, and as you will hear, uh, is a really vibrant uh, uh, voice um, and practical uh, and practitioner uh, around knowledge transfer, knowledge exchange in the region. Um, and we're really delighted to have you here, uh, Callum. So the floor is yours. Thanks, Stephen. That's a very generous introduction. Thank you. And a real pleasure to be here. Um, and just share my screen. Oh, it says that I'm unable to share my screen. Do you mind with me um, sharing privileges? Thank you. Ah, perfect, thanks. Great. Hopefully you can all see my slides. Yeah, OK. Fantastic. Um, again, thank you all for inviting me here. It's, it's a real pleasure and a real privilege. Um, as Stephen mentioned, uh, I do a lot of work in, in UNDP, the UN Development Programme, which I'll introduce in a moment, uh, particularly around urbanisation, um, but also its linkages with things like digital transformation, digital health, um, and beyond as well. Um, very delighted to be here, particularly because for me, this is much of a, a learning session as well, to learn more about your kind of research and broad opportunities to perhaps uh, collaborate as well. So for the next 20, 25 minutes or so, I'm just going to walk you through um, our kind of thinking around what it means for a smart city in the context of development, hopefully moving beyond the 5G, the AI that has kind of dominated the sector for quite a long time. So just to start with, um, a quick introduction to UNDP. Um, so we're the United Nations Development Programme. We have country offices in about 170 country office, countries and territories around the world. Um, and here in Singapore, we have what we call a global centre, the Global Centre for Technology, Innovation and Sustainable Development. And our mandate is very much to support those 170 country officers and also their local partners, whether government, private sector, civil society, academia, and also R&D um, actors as well. At UNDP, we work with all of these countries to expand um, to be people's choices for a fairer, more sustainable future to build the world that is envisioned by the 2030 Agenda for sustainable development, the sustainable development goals, trying to keep planets and people in balance. So just to get started, um, one of our big focus areas at UNDP is, is urbanization. And as I'm sure many of you know, by 2050, two out of three people in the world are likely to be living in cities or other urban environments. So close to 7 billion people. Um, smart cities are often seen as one solution to this challenge. And so often we're, highlight, we're asked, you know, what is a smart city? And if you search online, this is what you see. So pages after pages of big data, AI, 5G, um, often no people, often no trees or lives or livelihoods. So this is a kind of common definition of a smart city, but this is something that we're trying to, trying to redefine.
So often again, when we talk about the sustainable development goals and smart cities, we often focus on SDG number 11, sustainable cities and communities. But for us, truly smart cities are drivers of, of every single sustainable development goal, from tackling poverty and inequality, so SDGs number one and 10, through to the potential of precision agriculture for urban agriculture, so SDG number two, and even supporting the biodiversity of cities, so SDG number 15. So then for us, what does it then mean for a truly smart city? For us, we start to broaden our definition beyond just the high tech. Um, we're trying to highlight that smart cities should be about how we use technology, but also innovation to make the urban environment more inclusive, more people-centered, livable, and also sustainable. So again, fundamentally, smart cities need to be about people. If we look at this definition, that means that Singapore using high-tech solutions is one example of a smart city, but also Curitiba in Brazil, which is home to the world's first bus rapid transit system is also a smart city. Harare, the capital of Zimbabwe is also a smart city. The example you can see on the screen here is the Eastgate shopping center. Uh, it uses passive cooling to make the building environment comfortable, whether it's day or it's night. And this saves significant money and energy, particularly as Zimbabwe can experience considerable daily shifts in temperature. The Eastgate building was actually designed by a Zimbabwean born architect uh, in 1996. And then there's also Kathmandu with its network of electric taxis, many driven by female entrepreneurs, which have been in operation for more than two decades. Again, another model of a smart city. And then finally, return to Singapore again. Here, Singapore's using nature-based solutions to soak up and manage rainfall. Um, again, another definition of a smart city. And all these different typologies highlight why we urgently need to redefine the smart or the future city discourse. But again, why is this so important? Um, so what you can see on the screen here is a chart from UNDP's flagship human development report. It shows a drop in the human development index value, which is a global measure of economic and social development progress caused by COVID-19. For the first time in two decades, we're seeing global poverty start to increase. But COVID-19 has also given us a broader glimpse of what is coming particularly in the context of climate change. So cities account for more than 70% of global CO2 emissions. And they also consume over two thirds of the world's energy, but also 90, over 90% 90 of all urban areas are located on the world's coasts, where they're at considerable risk of flooding. And more than $4 trillion worth of urban assets will be at risk from, cl uh, from climate change by 2030. And again, it's a truly global challenge. So for the rest of this talk, I just wanna kind of walk through um, a few different ideas. Although COVID-19 is a glimpse of what is coming, it's also an opportunity for us to start to, uh, start to change and also to start to shape uh, different processes and ways of thinking. And this change needs to extend to how we think about what makes a city smart. So for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna share three things to think about um, and to prompt discussion. The first is an approach. Um, the second are some broader thoughts that we've drawn from our work with cities around the world. Um, and the third is a very recent initiative that we've launched that may be relevant to many of you um, in your work. So first one is an approach, uh, and the approach is on the screen here. It's a concept called donut economics. Um, the donut essentially consists of two rings, a social foundation, which you can see in green there, uh, to ensure essential needs are met, but also an ecological outer ring to stop us collectively overshooting the planetary boundaries that protect our world and our lives and our livelihoods. So the space between these two circles is a world that is both ecologically safe, but also socially just, a space where humanity can thrive. And we're seeing many and more and more cities around the world are starting to design their strategies, their plans, and their futures around the donut concept. Um, but a smart city really needs to be founded on the economic, environmental, and other qualities set out by this kind of approach. The donut is also accompanied by seven principles. I won't mention them all here and happy to share resources in the chat, but they include the importance of moving beyond GDP as a metric of success, but also the need to embrace complexity, systems, and the bigger picture in the urban context. And here are a few kind of broader thoughts. The first on the top left is the need that truly smart cities need to be agile and agile. So agile with a big A, but also agile with a small A. The big A is about agile project management and using that to inform inclusive and iterative public service development. The small A is about agile governance, responding to needs and changing realities, both online and offline. An example of this that you can see on the screen here, and we saw a lot of during the pandemic is things like tactical urbanism. Related to both of these though is the need to be citizen centric. Everything that cities do and are about should be for the benefit, support and empowerment of their citizens. 
This also extends to data. Uh, we often talk about big data for smart cities, and actually the graphic you can see on the bottom left is actually from uh, the Future Cities Lab and some of the great work you and the team are doing around big data for mobility. And um, this is very, very, very important, but we also need to think about things like lean data and thick data, qualitative mixed methods, spending time in and with communities. So the lives and the livelihoods behind each data point. And finally, going back to some of the case studies I mentioned earlier, we also need to be innovating and taking innovation from wherever it can be found. The building you can see on the bottom right hand side is actually from 19th century Iran and the two tall wind, ca uh, wind catchers cool the courtyard of this house. So again, taking innovation from wherever it can be found in any community um, and sharing between countries, cities and communities as well. This kind of commitment to sharing and collaborating is really, really important for us. There's no single smart city that we can point to around the world. So we should be talking to each other and learning what does and does not work. And finally, the, the UNDP initiative I just mentioned earlier that I'd like to walk you all through. Um, building on this importance of redefining what is a future and a smart city, we recently launched a handbook for city leaders, officials and, in, and innovators that provides a resource to start uh, putting a lot of this thinking and uh, into action. It also features a wheel like the donut, um, but what we found is that different types of smart city come from the interplay between different components. And these components are on the screen here. So first are actors, so local governments, the private sector, but also citizens and civil society. Next is understanding the role of these actors, whether it's an, initi an initiative or collaboration that is led by them, or if it's a kind of more broader collaborative effort is a very key framing. Second, um, beyond this, how are these actors using data and information? Again, this might be big data, it might be lean data, it might be community information, collective intelligence, and so on. And then finally, what tools are they using? For example, are they building new infrastructure and new assets? Are they using or reusing existing ones? And are they using high-tech or more frugal types of innovation? So based on this kind of interplay, we've identified four what we call smart or future city archetypes. I'm just gonna use mobility as a way to explain this in a bit more detail. So on the top left on the slide here, you can see what are the informal Matutu minibuses in Nairobi. So a Kenyan research institute has been working with drivers and volunteers to collect and analyze data um, from this network of Matutus to map and visualize the informal power transit system in Nairobi. So this is a kind of very community driven initiative, but with some support from government and others. So we can see some interplay here between different actors. On the bottom left, still in the mobility context is Waze, a, a Google backed solution that is improving traffic flow across the US by establishing localized and mobile based data sharing platforms to aggregate and democratize real-time information on road incidents, congestion, and other challenges. So this um, service was actually offered to the local governments as part of a broader public-private partnership um, to aid decision-making. So here we can see the private sector taking more of a leading role. Um, on the top right uh, is an app from a social enterprise in the Netherlands that aims to increase the mobility of people with disabilities. It guides users from door to door throughout their journey. Um, so nominated guardians on the app follow the user's journey using the app's features. Um, and the government actually enables the use of the app by covering the subscription fees for um, persons with disabilities. So this is something that has come from the community, but with government and the private sector as broad enablers. And finally, on the bottom right, um, the bus rapid transit system that I mentioned earlier in Curitiba. Um, this is an example of what we call an institutional pioneer. So government-led, citywide, scale solutions that are catalytic but also anchored in the use of significant state resources, but often also delivered in partnership with the private sector. So what we're trying to do with this handbook is to support urban innovators like you all in actually engaging more with communities, cities and others to try to um, pilot and then scale different innovations. And this is a, a quick um, highlight about how you can potentially start using this kind of framing or uh, methodology in your work. The first step is to identify the most dominant actors who are active uh, in the focus sector of your city. So this might be a particular region, a particular location, or a particular thematic area like mobility, like waste management, and so on. So for example, start looking at which actors are focused on the urban challenge you're looking to solve, which actor may be best positioned to lead the design and delivery of a solution to your challenge, and also which actors can play more of a supporting, facilitative, or collaborative role. Secondly, it's looking at determining the type of data and the available information um, required to support decision-making by these actors. 
So what kind of data is needed to diagnose and implement an effective solution? Where does this data originate? Can it be accessed? Is it locked away behind NDAs or is it publicly available? Uh, and at what stage and how often can this data and information be used to inform sol solution delivery? As part of this as well, it's looking at which tools you can leverage to support design and delivery of your particular solution. So what tools are available in the ecosystem? How can these tools be leveraged? And also what kinds of tools are required during diagnosis, design and implementation? For example, are new types of physical or digital infrastructure required? And what is the overall level of technology needed? Is it um, quite significant or is it uh, lower or more kind of types of frugal innovation? What isn't on this chart low is what we call the kind of feedback loop and the testing, learning or testing, adapting and learning process too. So for us, any work in, um, uh, in a city is very much about building that kind of feedback loop with citizens, residents and other stakeholders and testing, learning and adapting as we go. This includes looking at things like pilots, proofs of concept, but also methodologies to understand what is and isn't working. Sometimes this might be a qualitative feedback. It can sometimes be more expansive um, initiatives like randomized control trials, or it can be a kind of blended or mixed methods approach. But for us, that monitoring, learning and evaluation uh, cuts across all four of these different stages and also beyond. And in the handbook, we've provided and set out a global list of different case studies um, across the archetypes that I've just mentioned to provide inspiration. And we're actually now doing a, a bit of kind of more global research to start identifying other solutions that we can feature in a new website that we're hope, hoping to launch in the coming weeks. So we'd be very keen to feature any of your work uh, in that website. So I'll drop my email address into the chat after this um, and would welcome you submitting your kind of projects, collaborations or other initiatives and innovations so we can start documenting these for other cities and other innovators around the world. So just to, to wrap up with a few kind of broader final thoughts. Um, as I mentioned, we're doing urbanization efforts around the world. We work very closely with our friends and colleagues in places like UN Habitat um, and also others in the UN system, the development banks, and also the large private sector. Um, across all of these, we've seen a number of kind of key takeaways that I'm just gonna share with you here. The first is that cities remain a really key actor in the context of the sustainable development goals, but also in supporting and driving lives and livelihoods more broadly. We see cities are the real drivers of development from circular economies to maker spaces, but also the role of cities in providing and increasing opportunities um, for, for everyone. And this centrality demands that we engage with what cities mean in the development context. This also means that we need to be citizen centered, and that's also very much at the heart of our handbook. From an integrated response, putting citizens at the heart through to drawing on the perspectives of citizens through things like collective intelligence, but then also using financing and data to tackle the challenges that they're encountering. I've mentioned quite a few examples here today, and as I mentioned, we're very keen to hear more. But what's really exciting to us is that all cities are tackling similar challenges, but at just, uh, just different stages or different parts of that journey. So recognizing this, a point that I mentioned earlier is that we need to be really sharing, really sharing and committing to learning and best practice, both to reduce duplication, but also to increase and accelerate success. The new website that I mentioned earlier is one step that we're taking here, but we also have our UNDP city to city network, uh, which is another resource that cities use to connect with others and also to share um, innovations and projects and programs um, from their local, um, their local cities. And then finally, um, we need to be thinking more about smart cities, more about smart cities, but also fewer smart cities. As I mentioned, truly smart cities about more than just technology, but about leveraging innovation too, including things like nature-based solutions, but also need to be driven by the sustainable development goals. 5G and big data are important, but they themselves don't define a smart city. Um, for us and the cities that we work with, it's about how we use technology and innovation to shape more inclusive, livable and sustainable urban environments that meet the needs, the expectations, and the realities of citizens, residents, and other stakeholders. And particularly in the countries and the cities that we're working in, um, this redefinition has a very real and practical importance. Um, often when we talk about a smart city, um, particularly in lower income sit settings, um, city officials and mayors um, automatically almost disengage with the concept because they see a smart city as a, a linear pathway from where they are now to Singapore at the other end. And for us, that really misses the potential of technology and broader innovation in actually improving cities and urban lives and livelihoods. So I think it's really important for us to start redefining this concept of a smart city to make it truly globally relevant so that we can actually start engaging every city 
uh, in improving their urban environments and the lives of their residents. So I'll just stop there. Um, very happy to pick up anything in questions um, about our work, the work of our partners, but also very keen to hear from you all about innovations that we can perhaps start incorporating uh, in our handbook, uh, but also in our work more broadly. Thank you. Thanks very much, Callum. Thanks everybody. Um, so just to repeat, um, the chat room is open. Please post your questions and we'll start by going through the questions which have been posted. Um, and then we'll weave, weave a conversation around these uh, these themes. So let's um, begin. Uh, Matthew, is this right? Matthew Schonsberg, welcome. Um, he's an associate director of the program based in Zurich. Matthew, please unmute and the floor is yours. Thank you, Callum. This was fantastic. I would love to hear as a general uh, reflection, any of your experience in the epidemiology side of this. This is where we're really excited about certain mapping methods, for example, uh, spectrum mapping, where by showing proximities, um, for example, the John Snow map, the famous one of uh, London, if you show it with uh, uh, spectrum mapping instead of point data, you already get within five or six uh, iterations a clear image of what it took him 39 uh, patients to find out. So along those lines, I'm wondering if um, there's a way, because I think as you said, you know, there's a certain perception about what smart cities are about. And considering the history of the term, it's not a big surprise. I mean, we know it was first trademarked by IBM and it became a kind of platform and it was clearly used for surveillance capitalism in a lot of situations. We know something like 60% of the smart cities projects that are running around the world have been canceled or postponed since the pandemic started. And everybody seems to be turning to nature-based solutions. So I'm wondering if you know, maybe in this inventory you're making on your website, there's a special category for this about technologies that help us to cultivate our own implicit capabilities. For example, I mentioned this field space belt in Osnabrück University in Germany. It's very incredible. You wear the belt, it's got vibrating pads like in your phone, and it's always buzzing in the direction of north. So you wear this for three months and something like 90% of people then, they don't know where north is from now on. And that's interesting. Sometimes we do this with language. Some cultures use northwest, east, south as designation. Everybody knows north. But for cultures like ours, we use our phones, you know. So to what degree can the phone, maybe in the future, it's not even uh, uh, necessary. We have uh, learned it like training wheels. We have telepathy, for example. I mean, this is the kind of stuff we're going towards now, right? Maybe you have a few thoughts about that, if you could share. That'd be great. And there's, there's a lot to unpack there, like very, very <laughs> interesting. Um, so for us, um, there is a kind of risk of like tech determinism with a lot of the stuff that we see around smart cities. So ways to at least re-engage people with cities I think is really exciting. Um, one initiative that actually got spun out from Sidewalk Labs um, and is actually now very different to Sidewalk Labs is um, called DTPR, Digital Transparency in the Public Realm. Um, what's quite cool about this is they're building a whole taxonomy around trying to engage citizens with actual smart city concepts. So every time you see, for example, it might be a, a sensor at traffic lights or a, a video camera, there'll be a QR code or similar that you can scan with your phone. It'll tell you who owns that data, the purpose for the data collection, when it's being stored, when it's being deleted. And so it tries to engage people because often when we talk about smart cities or they're deployed, they are very, very abstract concepts, like you mentioned with, with things like the belt and similar. At the end of the scale, a lot of our work for the past two years, particularly through the Global Center here in Singapore, um, has been around kind of more locally driven supply chains. So things like 3D printing, maker spaces, and so on. And this is where I think things like the, the, space, the field space belt come, come out of. Um, there are new ways of building kind of more frugal, lower tech innovations that can actually be very, very exciting and very empowering for citizens as well. Um, for us, as a kind of broader piece there in terms of entrepreneurship development, because you're then building skills locally, you're building capacity locally as well. Um, so for us, the more kind of initiatives like this, the better, um, because it's very much a case of trying to make smart cities a bit more of a democratized concept beyond the kind of big vendors, but about that kind of more crowdsourced or local types of innovation. Um, and the open source community is really exciting here. Things like um, Safecast in Japan, huge kind of network of 3D printed um, sensors to map air quality and, and air pollution. That for me is a really exciting thing that's not owned by a particular big tech vendor. The data is not locked away behind NDAs. It's generally skewing towards a general digital public good. Um, and for us, that was very, very exciting. 
just a brief follow up question. I know we're going to have a lot of other great follow up questions coming. Why then, why not um, stick with the term that's usually used to describe what you're just talking about, that citizen science? Why try to call that smart city? Why not just let smart city go to the way of the dodo and just say what we're interested in is citizens, so it's cities and citizens. Maybe just as a, as a, we don't have an answer to that, but it's a really interesting question to me. Completely, I, I personally cannot stand the term smart cities. Um, I've been very keen for us to be redefined as, as future cities, but um, Stephen, I think you guys have already taken that one. Um, but yeah, for, for me, the, the smart piece is really problematic, but on the flip side, it also has recognition um, for our funders, for our partners and others. So that recognition could be quite important. So for us, what we're trying to do is actually redefine some of this discourse, then try to jump to an alternative one completely. But yeah, it's, it's enormously problematic and I'm not a big fan of the term. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks. Um, actually, it looks like a kind of thread. It's 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 coursing through this this question of what's smart and 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 to what end. Um, Zuna Meads, uh, are you here? Would you make yourself known and ask the question? Hi. Good afternoon. Hello. Just... Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. Hi. Would you like to um, articulate your question, please? Um, I actually uh, did a program, and I've actually been in contact with you, Mr. Kearns, from our department regarding a visit to the Singapore laboratory. Um, I think there's, a, there's a, a trend in our country that we also jumped onto the smart or the smart cities bandwagon um, as opposed to, and I'm actually quite pleased, I see a colleague of mine who works uh, with the integrated urban development framework for our country in the meeting. She might also want to add, we are currently in the process of developing what we're calling a smart region, the smart, um, uh, Eastern Seaboard region. So I would like to to just ask some questions on on your thoughts on the concept of of developing sort of polycentric cities in smart regions, and then also uh, I think we would like to take you up on your offer to have some one on one discussions and sort of further deliberations on this concept as we are still very much in the conceptual stage and and how we can really look at and the the area is is predominantly agriculture based uh, i'm sure you sort of well aware of the history of our country so it is an area that's fairly underdeveloped and how we can we can really um take all of these sort of conceptual um ideas and really develop a a firm um framework for developing a smart region. Thank you. Zuna, would you just quickly remind us where you are? So it says that you're here in South Africa, but where, where are you based? I apologies, yes, I'm in South Africa and uh, I work for our National Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development. And we are responsible for the uh, National Spatial Development Framework, which we are currently in the process of finalizing. And there's very specific, uh, what we call National Spatial Action Areas, defined around uh, urban innovation, um, scarcity of resources, um, looking at, at sort of a, a multitude or a multi-factor of components. But yes, that's what. Yeah, thanks a lot. Callum. Thanks, that's, that's a great point. Um, firstly, very happy to connect to our country office in, in South Africa um, for kind of follow-up conversations and, and we can be part of that as well. Um, but we do, actually a lot of our work is that kind of more regional or linkage area. Often when we try to work on smart city or, or urban projects um, in a capital city, it's, it's very, very difficult because of politics, legacy infrastructure and other elements as well. But when we get to secondary and tertiary cities, it's actually an enormous opportunity because these cities are very dynamic, very agile, and also have real sights on trying to become or, or even overtake their kind of capital counterparts. And so as part of that as well, that kind of smarter region component or the linkages between different cities um, for us is, is really exciting. Um, often as well, we talk a lot about migration from rural to urban areas. We don't talk about migration both ways or even migration between cities but for different opportunities either. And again, that's something that we often look at as that kind of smarter region um, or broader concept too. Um, another point about the kind of smart city discourse, which I didn't get into too much is, redefining what smart means, but also redefining what a city means sometimes too. So for us, a city is not just your kind of urban concentration, it's informal settlements, it's often that kind of linkages with suburban or rural communities. And then if you look at things like agriculture and broader livelihoods, there's that kind of uh, commonality too. Um, what we are trying to do is also leverage the ecosystem here in Singapore, and the, F the laboratory is, is one of our big partners for that, but also looking at things like vertical and urban farming. So Singapore's 30 by 30 initiative, which is um, 30% of um, self-sufficiency for food by 2030. 
Uh, and a lot of that work is about uh, vertical farming and urban farming, which could be quite valuable in the city. But also looking at countries like South Africa, where you have very strong uh, rural communities as well, trying to engage that as part of your kind of broader city plans. So I think for us, very happy to have a broader conversation. Um, we are doing some work in the region here and also across Sub-Saharan Africa um, around linking different cities, um, both within countries and also uh, across borders too. I'll then drop my email in the chat whilst I remember as well. So um, feel free to drop me a line, I'll, I'll follow up. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, we'll also be in touch. Uh, there's a great set of themes which are relevant, I think, to, to the work we're doing. Um, the next question is, in for, is from uh, W. Ritter. Would you mind making yourself known? And it's a good one. It's also, it comes in the form of a quiz. Uh, could you give us some examples um, on SDG 16? So, yes, yes, w. hello. Ritter, are you there? Yeah, I'm hello. here. Yes, yes, hello. Hi. Would you mind sorry. Switching, on, switching on your uh, your camera? I can, yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Hi, so welcome. I have Close been yours. working. Sorry? The floor is yours, worked... but you might you might have to remind us what SDG 16 is, or you, you could run a okay. quick quiz if you like. Yeah, that's I have been doing a couple of um, joined a couple of UNESCO sessions on that just this goal. It's on the uh, governance institutions, peace and justice. And so it also, um, because you mentioned the actors, but I think um, actors can only get involved in any kind of urban development if they are empowered. And that empowerment comes through, um, well, some kind of um, governance or political system that allows citizens to take part. And in many emerging economies, but also in other countries, that is not at all the case. As you know, we um, I think, uh, there are only like 40 countries that um, are kind of fully fledged democracies. So I think, um, I mean, having lived in Hong Kong for many years, um, I think um, there are really limits to participation and how is that defined and who defines that? So I think without addressing this power question, um, this whole smart city involvement will not go very far. That's my, uh, that's my, I would like to know your perspective on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so actually before I joined UNDP, I did a lot of work around SUG 16, particularly around things like digital ID and, and national ID and, and local ID. It's a hugely um, fundamentally important sustainable development goal for, for cities. Um, when we talk about peace, justice, and, and strong institutions, um, I think there's a different, a number of different elements we can look at in the context of a smart city. Um, as you say, there's that kind of baseline level of engagement um, that comes often through the political or the um, participatory space. Um, and we can look at different ways to that. So things like participatory budgeting is, is one element, um, but even building a baseline infrastructure for data collection from communities and providing spaces for voices to be heard as well. So. Um, we have a number of kind of open source initiatives across the world, things like Yu Shahidi, um, which have been very powerful across Sub-Saharan Africa in trying to give citizens voice and empowerment uh, in city and, and other debates. Um, the second piece is also on the kind of more institutional side within cities. Um, and often cities are the closest actor for, uh, to, to people and, and their lives and livelihoods, um, but sometimes don't have the processes or the funding to actually make these processes happen. So that's where we also look to civil society and other partners to start building and, and shaping some of these pieces too. Um, very much recognizing that it's, it's very much a, a marathon and, and not a sprint as well. Um, one element that I think is actually quite exciting but is often under, underlooked um, and underappreciated is around procurement. Um, it's not the most exciting topic, but actually it's a huge way to start engaging people in transparency of cities. So if you start building more open procurement systems in cities, um, this has quite a powerful multiplier effect you get more SMEs engaged with actually building new solutions. Often these solutions are driven by the local needs and realities of the communities. So again, another element of engagement. And often it can drive cities to be more accountable and transparent in their actions as well. Um, so we know people like the Open Contracting Partnership very well, who are building these kind of infrastructures uh, in cities around the world and actually having quite exciting uh, and important elements too. Um, and then the third bit is actually also trying to just um, empower citizens wherever we can. Um, particularly in the digital context, this can include things like digital literacy, um, but also access to devices, to uh, services where they can actually make their voices heard. And as I mentioned earlier, that kind of feedback loop. So making sure that it's not just a kind of one way dialogue, that cities are not just broadcasting out or citizens are not just sharing their thoughts, but actually trying to shape that dialogue as well. Um, but it does take time. Um, but personally for me, like SDG 16 is really, really fundamental for what smart cities should truly be. 
Thanks a lot. Um, just to let everybody know, um, the uh, please post uh, questions to the to the chat room. Um, Callum, I want to come back in a way to the, the question that, that we discussed earlier and the, the, the question of the smart city itself. I mean, one of the things that you do is so striking in a way is that you establish uh, the, the obvious kind of cliche, of the uh, which is widely held, so widely held. Uh, but then you give these wonderful examples of, of the BRT in Curitiba, Harare. Uh, you mentioned uh, tantalizingly, uh, you know, um, grassroots taxi driver networks in Kathmandu. So one after the other, you, in a way you undo the, the logic um, or the, at least the cliche that we have of this, of this idea. Um, and then in relation to the handbook, the handbook seems to be um, gathering a whole range of sort of direct action and techniques and guidance uh, to, that would back up this kind of widely globally observed sort of case studies. Um, does the question of the smartness still still matter in that case? In a way, you, you said that strategically on occasion, it's useful to use, but the examples you're using seem to be reaching for something sort of far more sort of diverse. Um, are the, are, does it still matter that we have a kind of theoretical framework or, or a kind of overarching kind of framework? So it's a very, very good question. Um, I think for us, that kind of framework or that thinking is, is a very strong mobilizational tool. So particularly when we're talking about um, politicians or policymakers, actually being able to communicate this in, in a way that can be um, you know, grasped by citizens, stakeholders, and has that kind of mobilizational power, I think is, is really valuable. Something similar to sustainable development goals that these are these big targets, but what they're mm -hmm. doing is actually driving attention, direction, and mobilization behind them. Um, as opposed to just talking more broadly about concepts like ending poverty or um, you know, tackling climate change, we can actually disaggregate them and, and focus uh, attention and, and resource and, and, and focus behind them. So I think that's where the, the framing is still, for me, very valuable. I think staying with the word smart is also quite useful in terms of actually seeing that smartness is almost back to the dic dictionary definition about being clever with your resources, your assets, your um, population, your human capital. Uh, and deploying them most effectively for your kind of local needs, your context and, and your realities as well. So, and also back to the point we mentioned earlier that there is still, the word smart cities isn't going away, sadly for me. Um, so actually how can we start redefining some of that concept to actually make it more inclusive? Um, particularly for many cities that we work with who sometimes completely wholesale switch off urban development once they hear the smart city tag, um, because they see it essentially as a, a kind of pathway to Singapore, which for many cities is not um, the right direction uh, and nor should it be either because there's very different uh, typologies of, of what a city should be. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, okay, now, yes, hands hands raised, also possible. Melissa, Melissa Permazel, floor is yours. Hi, thanks, Stephen. You might remember me from uh, Melbourne University. Yes, hello, um, nice to see you again. I haven't got my nickname up there as Moo, as you would know me. Um, and I'm, um, yes. look, thanks. This is, a, I'm really sorry I was late, but I'm just catching some of this discussion. And it's great um, to hear Callum give his reflections from UNDP, because we've been admiring all the work that they're doing. And I know my colleague Pontus connects with Callum um, yeah, quite a bit. And I just think this is a really interesting question about this framework, Stephen, that sits behind it. And, and I guess we've, we've really tried at UN Habitat, because we have a smart cities program uh, and we actually call it people-centered smart cities. So we always put that very clearly at the front. And, and I, I guess the framework that sits behind us clearly is the human rights uh, framework. Um, and and we, we sort of, and I think that's why we made a proactive decision to put in that people-centered component to, to um, our, the way we have conceptualized smart cities. Um, and very much um, try and, and, and a bit like as Callum said, you've got to look at the participatory elements. We look, spend a lot of time looking at this question of governance. And um, I know um, the question was raised before about power um, and also the question of digital rights and, um, and, and really the spatial element of cities and looking at not only are there places uh, that get different treatments and infrastructure and, and access to, to sort of what might be considered smart, uh, but also, of course, different identity groups experience that. So that it's really looking at trying to look at some of the nuances about around what's, what's smart and smart for who and, 
and and what my smart it might not be your smart or my new york smart is my not might not be my nairobi smart but it's transformative in nairobi none, nevertheless so i think i think i think that sort of the framework behind it is really important um, and I think cities often just sort of dive in. My impression is I'm not as experienced as Callum in this, perhaps, but um, that cities dive into it without thinking through what 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 is the drivers that we want behind it. What is the reality of our context? What are what are our governments that are pushing us um, to to um, take a certain direction, or you know think think smart and link it to entrepreneurship, but smart can come from cultural diversity or something like that. So I think it's a really great uh, question and important to, to, to think about it. Thanks. Mm. Thank you. Very much. Alan, do you want to react? Yeah, yeah, very much agree, Melissa. And, and actually, yeah, we, we very much have a, a close partnership between UNDP and UN, UN Habitat. Um, and I think this, this focus on technology as smart is, is part of the problem as well, because often if you're focusing on technology, then you become very solution led. Um, and so often half of our conversations are a country or city coming to us saying we want to use blockchain to do X, Y, Z. And our first question is, well, why blockchain? Um, and you dig into the detail and often you don't need blockchain, you need policies, you need governance structures, yeah. you need a functional database. Um, mm -hmm. And I think if you we keep this kind of typology of, of smart being tech led, then we're going to continue being tech and solution led instead of looking at the underlying problem mm -hmm. or the culture or the context. And, and I think for me that that's very dangerous and very damaging. Uh, and I think is perhaps slightly validated by some mm -hmm. of the, the kind of more failed tech uh, heavy smart cities that we've seen around the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thanks, Thanks Melissa. And I mean, Stephen, it's lovely sorry, to have my chat, my chat says disabled. I don't know if that's for other people. Mm. Okay, if it is, please just raise your hand. Um, we'd be happy to yeah, keep the conversation going. Yeah, nice great. Nice to see Thanks. you again, Melissa. Um, uh, we are fascinated by the fact that we have somebody from UNDP and UN Habitat <laughs> talking around the common theme. So we'd love to, in a way, Think a bit more perhaps on another occasion about the institutional frameworks. I think that's absolutely fascinating. And Melissa, thanks for these additional uh, sort of qualifications, if you like, you know, the smart of New York, which is not the smart or may not may overlap with this, the smart of Nairobi and so on. So I think it, these are very helpful kind of terms for, for, for all of us who are grappling with the universal sort of claims, if you like, of smart cities. So thanks again. Um, Matthew, the floor is yours again. Yeah, uh, you're, you're muted, I think, Matthew. It's really thrilling. You see, I'm so excited. It's thrilling to hear this conversation. It's very interesting because we've been living through, in our discipline as uh, architecture, design world, a kind of reinvention. Every five years or so, a new qualifier will be added to urbanism. So we have landscape urbanism and infrastructure urbanism. It's interesting because none of those words are necessary. If you take the word landscape from the 20th century or 19th century, it already has infrastructure and landscape is the basic ecology and infrastructure is landscape basically so this is really interesting about the terms now the sdgs it's not commonly understood but in fact they're economic indicators so there's a sort of bias in the assessment of sdgs so let's think about it for just a second where does the terminology come from for our discourse so mit now has a fantastic center they call a civic design data lab and that's very exciting because civic design was, in fact, the theme that was all of the things we're talking about. This was called civic design in the 19th century. Siegfried Gideon, the great Swiss architect, was teaching at MIT back in 53. And he was asked by Rockefeller Foundation to stop talking about civic design with its focus on ecology and community. They had a new agenda for him with some new funding. It's called urban design. And uh, it was a kind of rebranding of colonialism, you can say, because basically they had, it wasn't a bad intention, but it was very opportunistic. OK, so this is where we're going is how do we behave when we know, you know, MIT also has the other side. I don't want to hold up MIT as some exemplar. They have the new Center for Advanced Urbanism. And, you know, it's MasterCard Center for Advanced Urbanism. They funded it and that's their name. So we have capital, you know, surveillance capitalism is a reality for us. So this is really interesting what terms we use. And I just would really be interested, especially as I hear the, the, the UN people speaking here and having worked with the UN and knowing that there's some, a lot of really dedicated people, how the terminology affects the discourse is so crucial. I completely agree. Um, I might 
answer that actually in collaboration with another question from, from Gilberto around ISO standards too, because I think there's, there's interesting linkage here. Um, so on the ISO standard piece, we are, many of our friends and partners are working in, around ISO standards and implementing the, the one around smart cities. And it, it's often very valuable for um, cities to actually have that kind of uh, taxonomy or structure to start going down this pathway. This is not in relation to this standard in particular, but more broadly when we talk about standards behind technology and, and others is that um, often they're defined by those whose voices are in the room um, or they're defined by the voices or the terminology that has become established in, in that discourse. And actually a lot of our work at the Global Centre is actually how do we start broadening a lot of these platforms and collaborations. So for example, when we talk about things like AI or 5G, a lot of research for these tools and technologies is led by a handful of universities, often led in the Global North, um, whereas actually the entirety of the Global South is kind of cut out from these conversations. So then there's a kind of real issue that a lot of these technologies will become not necessarily imposed on these countries, but the countries could become test beds or trials for testing data sets, testing technologies. So again, there's, there's elements of exploitation there, but also fundamentally that these tools and approaches could be very valuable for these places, but actually there's no uh, contextualization or sensitization to them either. So for us, that's, that's kind of part of this broader discourse, actually, how do we unpack what these tools mean and, and these terminologies and, and where they come from? Um, but also how do we make the dialogue truly kind of globally relevant as well to make sure that we're using the right terms and making them as inclusive as possible. Um, but then the other extended list as well is that um, we are one voice in the space, obviously UN Habitat as well, we have many voices across the, the UN system. We, we can't do this without partners in the private sector, academia and others as well. So how do we also start building um, broader movements and broader discussions around this too? Um, and I think Melissa's dichotomy, the New York Nairobi piece is, is very important in terms of how we frame this. Um, because for us, it's, it's a truly kind of global conversation that needs to happen. Um, Melissa, I'll let you jump in as well, because we're talking a lot to you and your team about this too. I'll just quickly, Stephen, if I may, and, and thank you, Matthew, for that question. I, I just wanted to say that what I find interesting um, being not, 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 I'm pretty new to the smart city um, arena, and I find it some a little bit, there are quite a lot of tech people. So that sort of question of, how it's framed and constructed and the sort of language it's used. Um, there are not a lot of sort of perhaps sociologists or I'm, I'm a geographer by background and you know, like it's not, it's not, a, it's not a reflective space necessarily. Callum might have a perspective on this, but this is a quite a refreshing discussion. I mean, uh, I, I feel like that it's, it's sort of, it's almost looked down. If you're not a tech head and you're part of the smart city field, you're kind of a bit, of, you're either a Luddite or you're, you're like, you're in the wrong room. Like, did you, did you take, <laughs> open the wrong door? And I think that's a pity because then there's not this very um, important critical lens to say how this can be leveraged, but also what are the, you know, what are those power dynamics going on? Just because it's tech doesn't mean it's neutral. Who is in the city? Who has access to it and who doesn't? So I think the more people that the sort of discussions that we have and, and people that are involved that are from a range of sectors, which to me, uh, from the innovation unit perspective that we work in is really important, the better. But it's interesting that I find it is a very kind of techy, um, ICT type um, dominated arena, and and for those of us that that are self confessed not like that, uh, it's interesting because I tend to come in with these other questions. So it's an interesting area. Thank you. Good. Completely agree on that as well. And and for me as well, even when we do technology, we focus on the solution um, too much as well. For us, often the technology, even if you're looking at you know emerging tech like five G AI. The tech is a comparatively easy bit. The harder bit is the behavior change, whether in individuals, in communities, in institutions, to start embracing these solutions, whether technology or more broadly. And often that's a failure on our part in terms of the kind of broader community, because we're not spending time in communities. We're not learning the kind of needs, the realities, the aspirations. And we're not looking actually what solutions are often most relevant there either. For me, there's a bit of a tragedy also in a kind of broader civic tech space, um, that a lot of it is defined by apps on phones and, and so on. And that's not a failure of innovators. I think that's a failure of the kind of broader community that we're not potentially providing spaces or funding or opportunities for things like ethnography, um, elements like policy or governance or other structures. Often when we talk about civic tech, it's apps um, or it's mobile solutions or other kind of high tech pieces. Um, there's a huge potential for a more flourishing uh, civic tech space in my, my opinion too. Mm. 
Super, thank you. Um, Gilberto I, Velasquez, uh, I overlooked your question, so apologies. Um, if you're still here, would you make yourself known and ask the question? Hello, Gilberto. In a way, Callum, you've, in a way, you already alluded to this question earlier, but I'd like to hear, give Gilberto a chance to kind of respond, to ask it. Okay, he's still here, I think, or, um, so let, let's wait. Um, any other questions, any other comments, thoughts that haven't been expressed so far? Other themes? How about some of the, 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 um, the so-called techies? Uh, I know many colleagues would be uh, on, the, on the technical side, um, uh, but they're all in a way, in my experience at least, uh, sensitive to the questions, the sort of more critical questions that have been raised. Is there somebody um, on that side Sorry to name names, uh, but Peter Hertogs, I notice is here. <laughs> Peter, would you mind um, giving us your perspective on, on this work? I mean, the work that you're doing, I think is, is relevant. I think that the Callum's discussion. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, I, I think there's many aspects that I agree with um, in terms of the need to let's say represent uh, discourse and representations um, from our uh, perspective. Um, <clears throat> this can also be done in a technological way. So <clears throat> it's in a way finding ways in which um, we can address, uh, we're always dealing with in a way transdisciplinarity problems or the problems of bringing different domains and different uh, kind of people and terminologies together. Um, and while the project that we're working on looks at semantic web technologies and knowledge graph and is so in that sense, very techy, the backbone and, and the idea of making ontologies and knowledge representations and seeing how you know one representation fares versus another one or how you can merge these and make them work together. That concept in a sense works quantitatively and qualitatively. So even in a, in a, in a tech realm, there are approaches that can help build our knowledge better because to me, that is uh, an essential factor that underlies all the work, whether we're doing this technologically driven or, or human centered or whatever, our particular focus is in a way we're all trying to improve our knowledge. Um, and I think there's also approaches coming up again um, that can help that whether you're doing it, you know, tech driven or not tech driven and in a way that it becomes easier to work together. Um, so in that sense, uh, yeah, I'm, I don't have a techie uh, perspective in that sense. I think more a way of everybody has, you know, has a way to contribute to knowledge and we should look into technologies that so that you know each perspective can contribute to building that knowledge because each perspective has their own valuable inputs to put into this kind of shared knowledge uh, that mm -hmm. we are creating. Would, would very much agree with that and actually a lot of our work at, at UNDP is about facilitating these kind of discussions or convenings or, or communities of practice so far as that kind of commitment to, to knowledge and, and research and, and learning is, is a real priority um on a personal side though what one of the big things that does concern me about smart cities when we talk about it being very tech-led is that that knowledge isn't always shareable so a lot of the work that I've done um, with you know, tech companies and others is locked away behind NDAs, it's not replicable, it's not shareable. And for me, that's, that's a real fundamental scary concept around the concept of smart cities, but also the broader digital economy that there is research that we cannot replicate, we cannot learn from, and we cannot shape better solutions or, or you know, not make the same mistakes because we can't have access to, to data or to learning or, or other insights. Um, and so me, that's something that is perhaps under, under discussed. Um, but it's a really important concept in terms of actually how we engage more with technology, whether in uh, cities, uh, in the urban environment, or, or more widely as well. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, especially Peter, for raising this kind of false dichotomy. You know, sometimes theatrically, it's quite useful to have, uh, you know, tech and non-tech. But of course, this is a much more tangled uh, situation. Um, and this audience, in a way, probably represents that. Um, there's another question here from Argios uh, Oriopoulos. Um, would you make yourself known and, and uh, ask the question? 
or, or make the comment? Uh, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Go yes, ahead. you can. Um, if I switch my my camera on, the whole thing is going to drop. <laughs> um, so I'll don't just worry. Stay, just just we can hear you background. fine. So the, no, my comment, as it says, is like my background is more on the tech side. Um, and it's, it's very often that um, our approach is it's driven by data, which are associated with, um, with tech, right? And that's why our models and our work very often lack that human anthropocentric approach. Um, and, and the common, you know, the general question is how can we, can we get around this, this problem? How can we get through um, our hands on, on data that, that, that touch this uh, more, um, sociological anthropogenic um, um, side of, of the city because very often that smart term is, is associated with the tech and you know it kind of alienates people ordinary people not as researchers or academics um, um, and they cannot really see the, their, their own connection to what we call smart because they, they are nowhere to be to be found in our models and in, in our results thanks Caleb Definitely, then it's, it's a huge question, and it's something I think we struggle with in every country. There is also a role for this with technology. You know, things like sensors and, and so on can play a, a you know a valuable component to that. But for us, it's also just spending time in communities, investing in qualitative, uh, decent ethnography, and, and other elements too. The tricky thing though is often this doesn't have the same return on investment if you're doing a design sprint as, as part of you know a, a policy design or within a private sector entity either. So. There's a kind of broader cultural uh, mindset shift um, that I think is, is needed there as well. Um, but first, yeah, there's definitely a kind of real need that we see here um, in terms of actually doing this, doing this well. And even at the data that we collect, even if it is um, collected through technology to make sure it's as representative as, as possible. Um, we talk a lot and actually push quite a lot in UNDP for what we call digital public goods. Um, a lot of these, the time, these are things like um, software applications that are open sourced for cities or other innovators to use to kind of accelerate digital development. But then there's also kind of, I think, a broader discussion about what could be digital public goods in the context of a city. Um, there's actually a really exciting project now being funded by the, the Mozilla Foundation and also the Gates Foundation, um, where they're trying to create um, machine learning training set data sets for local and dialect languages across Africa, because often so much of this stuff is underrepresented. So even when we, when we talk about high tech and high data and, and big data, it's about making sure this stuff is representative and actually founded on the communities where we're working as well. Um, so I think that's part of this kind of broader uh, digital public good approach that I think could actually benefit from that kind of broader discussion about actually what makes a, a digital public good. Mm. Thanks a lot. I think um, we're almost out of time. So I, it just allows me a moment just to say thank you, uh, Callum. Thanks for being um, a great speaker, uh, drawing on such wonderful resources and also being a generous uh, open open with your contacts. I'll give everybody a moment to, to maybe catch some of these. There's some wonderful links, yeah, uh, including fantastic. the handbook, the UNDP handbook, which has been posted. So please take a, mo a moment to, to catch those. Um, you'll hear more, you, you'll be able to see the kind of YouTube recording of this and go back to some of Callum's slides as well. Um, I think we'd like to invite you to watch this space. Um, Future Cities Lab is very excited to be working with UNDP and we really want to do some good work. You can see this marvelous kind of synergies and complementarities, at least we, we, we like to think so. So um, um, I'm, I really hope this, this is the beginning of another set of uh, maybe a longer set of uh, discussions and then of course, uh, ultimately actions. So thanks again. And please uh, let's thank it, Callum in the best possible way we can give despite the, the Zoom uh, interface. So thanks Callum. Hey, thank you everyone. Thanks for the great discussion as well. And please keep in touch. Yeah.